All right, so welcome to your first lesson on the periodic table. So unit three is going to be all about the periodic table, patterns and characteristics and categorization, all things that you are going to be using and applying to getting the questions, rates on tests and quizzes in this unit, as well as patterns that are going to continue to be useful for us going forward. All right, so there's going to be the group classifications, there's the valence electron pattern, there's going to be things like electronegativity, radius, ionization energy. All right, in the end, you're going to be able to, you know, use a clue like this one down at the bottom, a group of highly reactive nonmetals with seven valence electrons. That's going to be enough information for you to tell me where on the periodic table I'm talking about. All right. So before we get started into this classification, just a little history lesson here. So the first periodic table was created by Dmitri Mendeleev back in 1869. And his table looks like the one here, right? A little different looking than the table we have now, a lot smaller. Um, there were some elements that he thought were there, but had, hadn't been discovered yet. We have discovered them now. One of the key differences is Mendeleev ordered everything by atomic mass. Right? We use something different now. So our current periodic table looks like this one. And actually, even this one is a little bit outdated because there, this element here I know has been discovered. And they have ideas of what these elements are. But the law that we use or how we organize this, that has stayed the same, at least while I've been alive. And then, so we call this periodic law. And we organize the periodic table by atomic number, as well as common chemical and physical properties that tend to repeat among the atoms. All right, so everything that's in the same column actually has common properties, either physical or chemical. All right. So that's how we determine the order of our periodic table. So the point of the next few lessons is going to be getting you to create your own personal periodic table, get it all labeled, get a bunch of information on there so that you have this to use for unit three and going forward in this class. All right, because we're going to use a periodic table a lot. So if you are watching this recording, you have a couple options. If you were in class, you would have been prompted to download the file. It's a picture file of a blank periodic table. Or if you missed that or you're just watching this recording after live class, go to the course materials. There is a link for you to download the picture there as well. All right, blank periodic table. And it should look, you're going to want to open it in a program like Paint, and it'll look like this. All right. I removed the title and things like that just because it gives us a little more room to write things. And there should be a bunch of blank space off to the side and below, which again is going to give us some room to add some notes. And the first note I want you to add is periodic law. All right. And I'm in a vocab term. I want you to make that bold. Uh, the shortcut I use there is if you highlight it and hit control B, that will make it bold. And I'm just going to scoot this up all the way to the top. I want plenty of room and make this box wider. But periodic law is the the organization that we use on the periodic table. We order it by atomic number and repeating chemical and physical properties. All right? Columns have similar properties. We're going to get into even more detail about what these columns have in common with each other. This is just a general trend right now. Some other general trends that we're going to add is the groups and the periods. All right, so groups are your columns. Periods 
Ah, your rows. We're going to stick to the basic numbering for this, but I, there is actually a second type of group numbering that we will talk about in the next class. All right, but your groups go from 1 to 18. Just clicking away so that I can make sure to keep this above the column. I'm putting it kind of off to the left so that there's room to add the second numbering that's used sometimes for groups. Um, I'm doing this along with you because I'm hoping that this isn't going to go so fast that you can't keep up yourself. But if you need to, please pause the video. So groups go from 1 to 18. Periods go from 1 to 7. And then these two down here, if you kind of look at this little line here, this is showing you that this is actually pulled out of the periodic table. This belongs right here. But what this would do is it would take this, this big section of the periodic table and kick it way off to the right. And you'd have this little skinny section that's only two elements high. These elements do have their own characteristics separate from the main periodic table, which is one reason why they're pulled out. Another reason why they're pulled out is if we were to make this table essentially twice as wide as it is, it's actually really hard to fit on a single piece of paper in a textbook and still be able to read everything. So they pull this out because these do have their own unique characteristics and it makes it so everything can fit on one page. So I would label these as six and seven so that you remember those are periods. Six and seven, they don't get group numbers. All right, next. The next thing we wanna do is talk about the classification of metals versus non-metals. This is a big one. Our focus for today's, or this recording is going to be metals. So first things first, let's get the line on here that separates these. So I want you to draw this, make it nice and thick. Try your best not to cover up any of the words. But this zigzag line separates your metals from your non-metals. All right, and then I'm also going to draw a box around hydrogen because everything to the right of this line, including hydrogen, all right, everything to the right is nonmetal. So I'm going to bring that up. Then everything to the left is metal. All right, the only exception to that rule is hydrogen, which is why we put that black box around hydrogen just to make it stick out. All right, hydrogen is the only element on the left side of the periodic table that is still a nonmetal. And you know this because you're familiar with hydrogen being a gas. It's something that's in our atmosphere. All right, and things that are gases aren't metals. All right, because we're going to get this on here, we're actually going to create a T chart, and I will. This is again a reason why I am writing this along with you guys. Go ahead and get a T chart formed. Unbold this metal, non metal. All right, so metals conduct heat and electricity. So 
I just spell that correctly? Electricity. There we go. They are malleable. They are ductile. They have tensile strength. They have luster. And they form positive ions. All right, so a couple of things. I think you know what conducting heat and electricity is. But these other terms, malleable, ductile, and tensile strength. What's, what's a common use that we have of metals? Like maybe something you might wear. All right, hoping you kind of are thinking of jewelry, or you can even, our picture here, King Tut's sarcophagus. All right, these three characteristics, the malleable, ductile, and tensile strength, they relate to the ability to use metals to shape it and turn it into these like beautiful pieces of jewelry and art and things like that. All right, so I'm just gonna grab my pencil tool here. Just kind of so these are all related to changing shape. I don't think I can actually squeeze that in there. So I'm going to just type the word shape real tiny. That's going to be your reminder. All right, so you can change the shape of those things. If you're not sure what luster means, all right, luster means shiny. All right, and then who can remind me, what's, what's a positive ion? What's going on with your protons, neutrons, or electrons if you're forming an ion? Hopefully you're remembering that ions should have a different number of electrons, and if it's positive, that means it's losing an electron. All right, so let's talk about our different metal groups. The first one, all right, you can see in the box right here, we have alkali metals. And let's see, we're going to make those red. I'm going to put a box around here. And we know the alkali metals are red. And then I'm going to make this a little bit thinner so I don't end up overwriting anything. And my alkali metals. There we go not to cover up numbers here are this first column right here all right and then I'm gonna do some note taking on our alkali metals a bigger font all right so the characteristics of alkali metals are that they have one valence electron. Does anyone know what a valence electron is? I know we haven't defined it yet. So in case you don't know, it is the electrons that are available for reacting. So valence electrons have one electron in their outermost shell that is available to react and bond with other chemicals. All right, so these are never pure in nature. They are super, super reactive. All right, so they're highly reactive, especially with water. I'm just gonna keep making this bigger so that all of this fits in one line. And then reactivity increases as you go down. So there's your notes for your alkali metals. Right next door, might be green. The box. Column two is your alkaline earth metals. 
some notes about those. Your alkaline earth metals all have two valence electrons. They are less reactive than alkali metals, but still not pure in nature. I need to make this box wider. And a little piece of information here, that word alkaline that means basic. You often find these in bases, as in from acid and base. All right. So your next major metal group, this is a big one. We're going to make these guys blue. Is your transition metals. All right. So the transition metals, you if you really get detailed into a class, a chemistry class you might break these up more but for the scope of this class you just need to know the transition metals as a group all right so that's everything in this box down here all right and your transition metals are your just kind of typical metals All right, so this is what you typically think of when you hear the word metal. All right, so if you're familiar with thinking of like iron is metal and copper is metal and gold is metal, all right, the, this is, those are all transition metals. Your typical hard, solid, pure chunks of metal. All right, some notable ones just to be aware of all right there's no there's no valence electron pattern anything like that um one that you want to be familiar with that is kind of unique mercury which is symbol hg is liquid at room temperature everything else is solid at room temperature all right so there's your transition metals. Another group to know, and actually we are going, ooh, there we go, to label these with orange. I'm actually going to Label these together. The lanthanides and the actinides, they have a different name called the inner transition metals. All right. I'm even going to write that up here. Inner transition metals. All right. But, and these are the, the this is that pair of rows that gets pulled out. Those guys have actually their own distinct differences. So let's get those on our screen here. Maybe I'll take the notes for them right underneath. Inner transition metals. All right, so these have some similar characteristics to the rest of the transition metals. So they have similar, what they call electron configurations, or kind of how the electrons are ordered. Configuration to transition metals. But what I do want you to know is some specifics. So the lanthanides. That name comes from lanthanum, which is number 57, the very first one in the top row. The lanthanides are 
So AK, sometimes they are also referred to AKA, also known as the rare earth elements. Right, so they are all naturally occurring, but they are in very small amounts on earth. I am going to fold that one and underline it just so that sticks out to you guys. Then the actinides, on the other hand, all right, they are all radioactive. All right, so the actinides come from the first element in the second row is called actinium. So that's where their name comes from. So they are all radioactive. And most are laboratory made. In fact, the only ones that aren't laboratory made are the first four. Actinium through uranium are natural. Everything else in that list is laboratory made. Okay, and I'm going to bold and underline that one too. So these changes that I'm making, the color coding and all of that stuff, I hope you are doing that too, because this is hopefully going to help you, you know, quickly identify things. You might be given an element and be asked what's a characteristic about it, or you might be like, oh, which of these elements are laboratory made? Well, hmm, I know in orange, the actinides, those have laboratory maids. Are there any of these in my choices? Questions like that. All right, the last metal group is kind of a I need to change colors here. Make these guys pink. All right, so my last metal group is going to be the other metals. And this is just kind of a hey, this is the last section we got to label these. So, follow along carefully so you don't accidentally highlight something that's part of a different group but it goes down from aluminum over to livermorium and then we kind of do this staircasing so i'm going to go up trying not to cover up the black line completely so that i can still see that but polonium is not part of this but bismuth is And antimony is not part of this, but tin is. And then germanium is not part of this, but aluminum and gallium are. All right, so these are your, I don't want to cover up the 13 because that's going to be important to be able to see later. There we go. All right, so your other metals. I'm gonna throw their information down here next to the transition. So there's the other metals. All right, they are between transition metals and metalloids, which we'll talk about in the next lesson. Make this wider. And I guess I'll drag it up. Sorry, I just want to make sure there's going to be room. And these have all the characteristics of metals, but like on the weaker end, all right, have less strong metal characteristics. All right, so such as lower boiling points, more brittle, so they're easier, they're less malleable. Um, they're softer, things like that. 
All right. So that's the metal characteristics. There will be another recording for the metalloids and the um, non-metals coming up.